Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 of your booklet. Section 1. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you rent apartments here? Yes, among other things. Are you looking to rent an apartment? Maybe, but I think I might actually be more interested in renting a house. Do you rent those as well? Yes, we do. Will you be renting alone? No, I have two friends that will live with me, but I'll be the primary renter. My friends don't have a source of income, which is kind of disappointing, but I do. I'm an artist, and I've already sold a number of paintings. I just moved to town to try to get more of my work shown. Oh, so you would like to be near the uptown area? That's where most of the galleries are, right? Yes, and there's a large area of homes only a couple of blocks away. Great. I don't have a car, so I prefer being within biking distance of the galleries. That would certainly be possible. Well... Let me see. There's a large four-bedroom house right off Main Street. That sounds good. I'd love to have extra rooms for my paintings. How much is it per month? Around $950. Ouch! That's too much for now. Do you have anything a bit cheaper? I have a three-bedroom that's for $650. Hmm. That is definitely affordable. But I did want at least one extra room. Is there anything else with more rooms? Oh, here's another five-bedroom that's vacant right now. It's further away, about a mile from the gallery area. But they're only asking $800. That's a deal for so much space. Well, a mile isn't so bad. It's only a five-minute bike ride. And that price is OK. I'd like to see that one. Can you give me the address? Sure. It's on 1566 Honeysuckle. H-O-N-E-Y-S-U-C-K-L-E, -E, Drive, Wood Heights. Now look at questions 7 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 7 to 10. Mmm, such a lyrical street name. I like it. Is it furnished? Partially. It has a couch and chairs, a dining table, refrigerator and stove, a wardrobe, a couple of dresses and such, but no beds. Does it have a washer and dryer? It doesn't say here. But why don't you go and take a look? Here's a key. Just bring it back today before five. We'll do that. An hour or two later. Hi, you're back. How did you like it? A lot. But I know why it's listed so low. A couple of windows are broken and they definitely need to be fixed. I'm surprised no one has broken into the house and taken anything. That should be fixed right away. No problem. I'll get a work crew out there today. That should be fixed even if you don't rent it yourselves. Did they have a washer and dryer? No, but I can wash clothes by hand until I find good used ones. There was another thing, though. The tiles in the kitchen floor were broken and lying all over the place. You'd need to put in a new kitchen floor as well. OK. I'll talk about that with the landlord. If you can do those two things, then I'll take it as soon as you're ready. This is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear a talk given by Dr. Wallace. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When the University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s, much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's Arboretum Committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the Arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscapes, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration, the process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognized the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum, and provided most of the labor needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, like most Arboreta, has traditional collections of labeled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. This is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas, and efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals. We see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the Minimum Critical Size of Ecosystems project. 
Could you tell me about it? A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practicing conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated, so they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large, something on the order of 1,000 square kilometres. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So when 50% of a forest is lost, the remaining 50% being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that 50% has been lost. And this affects not just forest, but species diversity, correct? In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes. But we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else and those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritising refuges? Yes, it was the first time that someone looked basin-wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugee areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990 after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data including information about the vectors of development. Roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. This is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. In this section, you are going to hear a talk on wild rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. 
Today we'd like to talk about wild rice. Contrary to what many people believe, wild rice is not rice at all, but a grass. Much of it sold in the world today is not even wild, but rather cultivated varieties that do not occur naturally. Wild rice is really an annual aquatic seed found mostly in the upper freshwater lakes of Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota in North America. Indians gathered wild rice before any explorers set foot on the North American continent. Early explorers were greatly impressed with the strength and hardiness of the woodland Indians and attributed their vitality to their ample servings of wild rice. Wild rice can grow in water as shallow as three or four feet along marshes and muddy waters. A tall plant, it grows to a height of 8 to 10 feet, with a long flower cluster that reminds one of a narrow broom. The grains in their husks on the tall stalk look somewhat like oats. Truly wild rice is a challenging crop to grow. Even today, it's very susceptible to failure due to weather conditions. If a heavy windstorm comes along just before harvesting, the seeds can be blown into the water, ruining an entire crop. Harvesting at just the right time becomes a matter of beating the birds to it, since wild rice is considered a delicacy by many birds living in the area. Other challenges include insects, disease, poor drainage, and high waters. If the grains are too green, they are difficult to thresh or beat out of their husks. If left on the plant too long, even a few days too long, they fall off the plant into the water. Airboats have brought about recent improvements in commercial harvesting of the wild rice, while newer techniques for parching, winnowing and hulling have been a help in saving time and labour. Still, it takes about three pounds of grass seed to yield one pound of wild rice. Buyers should be aware of two types of wild rice, gathered and commercial. Foraged or hand harvested wild rice is gradually being pushed out of the market by hybrid commercial varieties. Hand harvested wild rice makes up less than 20% of the market today. Heirloom varieties of this foraged grain still exist. In fact, it is the only heirloom grain sold commercially. However, package labels can be deceiving. Though the label may read Indian harvested or organic, the product may be hybridised wild rice placed in freshwater lakes and gathered by Indians in airboats. Hand harvested, organic and from the Great Lakes region is the real thing with superior flavour and aroma, but it may be difficult to find. Though wild rice is one of the most expensive grains, it goes a long way. Some say that one pound of the grain can feed 30 people. To compensate for its high cost, try combining wild rice half and half with brown rice. For a truly colourful presentation, try one third of each white rice, brown rice, and wild rice. This is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.